I'll try not to wander. Oh, it's where's where's that? Am I in the in your picture? Yeah, you posted that like that. It's got okay. All right, <laughs> got it. We'll be walking out to the side and <laughs> disappear for a little bit. Thanks for having me. Um, it's always it's always nice to be here and to have a chance to talk with you. Uh, at this point in your um, academic journey, and the point where you're trying to decide is this where you want to work? Is this the, do you want to work in healthcare? Uh, I, I, I like to tell each class that, that um, I, was, I was here at one point many years ago, not in this building, but in another, but in this class. And, uh, um, uh, you know, I, to this day, um, I still use some of the skills that I learned in this class when I take care of patients every day at our hospital, um, 20 plus years later. Uh, I've been practicing as a physical therapist since uh, for uh, 16 plus years and uh, uh, really have, have enjoyed it. And uh, I think it's, it's, uh, uh, it's good that you're here and you're exploring these career paths right now and, and, uh, because it's nice to kind of have some idea of what you're doing next. Um, uh, you know, uh, you're juniors and seniors, right? Mostly so. Um, you may not have it all figured out yet, but uh, you do want to have some general idea of where you're headed. So what I want to do today is talk to you about, um, I'll talk to you about physical therapy because that is my profession, but we'll also, <clears throat> we'll also talk a little bit about the other therapies that uh, we have as well. So my role right now is, is, is our manager of our therapy services here in Monette and uh, with Cox, and we have a clinic in Cassville, but we service our hospital, uh, our two clinics, Cassville and Monette. And we have therapists that go out to a lot of different places and take care of patients as well, like homes, uh, especially children. We see children in their homes or the school setting. Some of you may be here local may know of Barry Lawrence Development Center, um, where kids uh, who aren't ready to be in school yet may, may be um, there during the day, and we do therapy with them as well. So, uh, but we have physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy services uh, here at Cox Monette. <clears throat> and uh, um, I'll, I'll touch on each one of those. But generally, I'm, I'm a physical therapist, and so when you think of physical therapy, what, what do you think of? What's the first kind of thing that comes to mind? Yeah. Exercise. Exercise, right? What else? Is there anything else? Because that's kind of a big one. What else? Kind of like massage. Massage or something hands-on, right? Yeah, that's good too. What else? Anything? Yeah, did you just have something? No, just thinking? Okay. What I'm going to try to convince you of is that physical therapy is much more than exercise. It's much more than just maybe massage or hands-on manual techniques. It's a lot. Okay, so we see patients who might, you know, for generally, what we do is we help with movement. Physical therapists are movement experts, right? And for the most part, we, we address gross motor movements. And when I say that, do you know what I mean? What's gross motor? The opposite would be fine motor. What's fine motor? What's fine motor tax? Motor meaning movement. So fine movements. What's a fine movement that you've done today? Fingers, hands, writing. You're writing. You're opening up your water bottle. You're manipulating your hands. Okay? That's fine motor. And that's really what occupational therapists work mostly on. It's fine motor tasks. Physical therapists work on gross motor tasks. So you got you, you, this morning you wake up, you roll over, and you set yourself up out of bed. You stand up, you walk to the bathroom, you put your clothes on, you shower, whatever else you do, walking, okay? Those are all gross motor tasks, okay? Holding yourself upright, okay? Where you're using large muscle groups to produce movement, all right? So it can be things as simple as that. It can be things as complex as athletic movements, okay, that have a lot of different parts to them, all right? So that's kind of the difference between physical therapy and occupational therapy. Occupational therapists, you know, you might have an upper body or an upper extremity injury, hands, wrist, elbows, maybe even shoulder, and you can't, you can't, you know, operate your phone. You know, you, you can't hold it and push buttons because your, your fingers have been injured, your hands have been injured. Maybe you can't write your name, you can't take notes in class, you can't keyboard, can't drive, brush your teeth, you know, comb your hair, all these different things. 
when you hear of occupational therapy, you think of work, right? Occupation or a job. And so that can sometimes be misleading, but the, but the reality is it's what you do each day. It's the daily activities that you do, whether it's work or personal activities, like we talked about, that occupational therapists focus on a lot when they're working with their patients. We see patients of all ages, all right? Our occupational therapist may be seeing a one-year-old child who can't grasp a fork to put food in his mouth, okay? Or they may be seeing a 90-year-old woman who's having a hard time um, managing her dressing, getting herself dressed uh, because of whatever she might be dealing with. Same thing with physical therapy. Our physical therapist may be taking care of kids that are just born. So we have physical therapists and even occupational therapists in the NICU at our hospital in Springfield trying to give these newborn babies that aren't quite, pre, aren't quite full term some experiences and positions that will help in their development so that they're not any farther behind than they already are coming into the world, okay? We may take care of physical therapists maybe working with somebody at the end of their life or near the end of their life, okay? Because they just have lost their ability to move and to be mobile, all right? So we see the whole spectrum. Once you think of, of like reasons why we might see somebody, so you've, you've talked about exercise, and when you think about exercise and therapy, you think of what type of injury or problem? What system of the body is really used, involved a lot of times when you're talking about exercise? Think of, mus think of body systems. Muscular, musculoskeletal system, right? It's really common. We're taking care of musculoskeletal problems, okay? But thinking along system lines, again, what other, what other systems might go wrong in your body that might help, help, help control movement? Nervous system, okay? So think of the, all those nervous system problems you might have. What might some of those be? You've got brain, spinal cord, and peripheral nerves, right? Central nervous system, peripheral nervous system. What can go wrong with those? You talked about these pathologies that might happen, like a stroke. Somebody has a stroke, something goes wrong in their brain, and they lose some of that nerve function. It affects how their muscles work. It may affect how they feel, how they you know, sense, sense things. So maybe a stroke might be a, an injury to somebody's spinal cord. might be a brain injury where they just get, get hit in the head and, and they have swelling or something on the brain that causes their nervous system. So we've got musculoskeletal system problems, nervous system problems. Think there's any others? What else? What fuels our body? What, what gives my muscles the ability to do the work that they do? That's right, circulatory system, cardiovascular system. We gotta, you gotta pump blood through your body to your muscles so that your muscles have the energy to go and do what they do, right? So you've got somebody who's, who has a problem with their cardiovascular system, we may be involved and there's where exercise comes into play too, okay? But beyond that, we, we may be, I, I do wound care. So physical therapists, I know it sounds crazy, but some, some physical therapists are trained to take care of wounds that patients have. Maybe they're trained to take care of swelling or lymphedema, chronic, chronic uh, swelling in somebody's limbs. That may be something that they do, okay? Um, so a lot of different, they're, they're, my point is saying this is that physical therapy is not just exercise. It's a big part of it. It's a lot of other things that, um, really relate to how somebody functions and how they how they move. Okay. There, within uh, uh, our career path, you kind of have kind of two options as as in physical therapy. You can be a physical therapist or you can be a physical therapist assistant. Okay. And here's the difference, and it goes the same way with occupational therapist and occupational therapist assistant. The, the the therapist versus the assistant. The therapist is responsible for evaluating a patient when they come to see you, assessing them, doing an examination of movement and, and identifying what's wrong. What are the impairments or limitations this person has? From there, <clears throat> then we determine what we need to do to make those better. That's the plan. That's the treatment that we're going to do. So we establish a plan of care and we set goals for that patient. So w w where do we want them to go? What, what do we want them to achieve? This patient sprained their ankle, they can't run. We want to make sure that that gets better, it heals, so that they can run and play their sport again if that's what it is, okay? 
Same thing with occupational therapists. They're assessing, determining limitations and impairments, determining plan of care and setting goals. The assistant is responsible for carrying out the plan of care. So whatever it might be, hands-on therapy, exercise modalities or ultrasound or electrical stimulation or teaching somebody how to move a little bit better. They carry those treatments out, but they don't have the ability to, um, to determine what to do. Okay, the therapist really drives the plan of care. The therapist assistant carries that out. The therapist assistant can't change that plan of care necessarily. The therapist has to, but they still have a very important and integral role in taking care of the patient. They have to be very highly skilled in how they deliver their care because ultimately the outcome for that patient is determined by the quality of care we give. Okay, so two, two different paths between uh, therapists and assistants between physical and occupational therapy. Uh, different um, um, a academic paths as well. Okay, so as a physical therapist, physical therapist is going to be in college for about seven years. You graduate with a doctorate degree. Occupational therapist, same thing, maybe six to seven, master's degree, some doctorate level programs as well. Okay. So you've got to have a nice, you've you got to go into this, thing, you, being able to commit to that type of, of, of coursework and, and time after you get out of school, after you get out of high school. Assistants um, are an associate's uh, a degree program, okay? So usually those, you know, once you graduate high school, you may be an occupational therapist assistant within the first couple of years if you take full-time coursework. You, so many of you all are graduating with, with college credits that you may be able to accelerate that uh, much different than it was when I was in school. And, uh, and so you're, you're looking at a few years, two to three, instead of maybe seven. Okay? But as you can imagine, therapist versus therapist assistant, the reimbursement, the pay, right? The pay is, the pay is different. Okay, so if you go to school for seven years and you have a doctorate degree, you're going to make more money than somebody that goes to school for a couple of years and has an associate's degree, and the level of, 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 of uh, responsibility in your role is higher as a therapist, and therefore, again, your, your, your salary is going to be higher, okay? So for a PT and an OT, an annual salary right now, you're going to make probably between $25 to $30 an hour starting, okay? So that's anywhere from fifty to $60,000 a year, gross, gross salary. It's probably going to be between 25 and 30, probably, probably in the 27 to 28 range to start. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then a therapist assistant um, starting more uh, at the you know, $20 an hour range, maybe a little bit more or less, depending on your setting and where you're working, what part of the country you're working in. Okay. So you can tell it's a pretty good difference in, in um, starting wages. Okay, and earning potential between the two, all right? Both are pretty rewarding career paths though, okay? One of the nice things that, about being a therapist is that um, it's a day job, right? We work, you know, daytime shift, um, no after, you know, no overnights. Um, you know, it's not a 20, therapy is not a 24-7 department of the hospital like, like um, you know, med surge floors or, or ICU or the or emergency department uh, where we're taking, you're taking care of patients at all hours. And uh, so that's nice. You got to work some weekends sometimes. That's sometimes not what people want to do. We got to work weekends because we still have patients in our hospital that need therapy on Saturday and Sunday and so we take care of them then. What's the other thing that's really rewarding about about, and this is this goes for for healthcare in general, right? Is that if you're interested in the healthcare field, you probably you got a little compassion inside, don't you? Right? You you care about others. You want to see people be healthy. You want to see them get better, right? I mean, if you're going to be a nurse, if you're going to be a doctor, uh, a therapist, a, a respiratory therapist, even working in radiology, all these all these professions that we have in healthcare really are directed at our one main goal, and that's, and that's our patient. We, we want our patients to, to, to do well, to get better, and to be healthy. And, and I think the therapies, are, they're, they're one of those areas where you really have to get to play a really important role in that, 
Okay? You have patients that come to you that might be really debilitated. Their life has changed drastically, okay? It may be that somebody has been in a bad car accident and they have multiple fractures. Maybe their spine's fractured, their arms, their legs are fractured. They come to me in a wheelchair, whereas they were perfectly normal prior to their accident, okay? They're in pain, they're weak, they can't move very well, right? And you, have, you have the opportunity as a therapist to work with that patient, increase their joint range of motion to make them stronger again, to help them learn how to walk again. And so after a couple of months, maybe after somebody's been, their life has been totally changed, you have a huge role in getting them back to normal, okay? I don't know what you think, but for me, that's that's a rewarding, that's a rewarding profession for me to have a have that impact on that somebody's life. Those people remember you, right? I fractured my femur when I was a freshman in high school, and I had a lot of therapy. I remember those encounters that I had in therapy. I remember those people that helped me get back to playing sports again after I'd had surgery to repair my femur. So, you know. It's, it's really, if you want something where you can truly have an impact, therapies are, are a good career path to take. I haven't talked much about speech therapy, but I'll touch on it as well. Um, speech therapist, obviously by name, you think, okay, we're, they're helping people learn how to speak, right? It's really much more than that, because speech has a lot of components to it. One, we have to produce, we have to produce sound, right? But not just producing sound, we have to we have to coordinate that sound to make to form words, right? All right. We also have to have enough volume uh, and quality in our voice for you to hear me and understand me. All right. So not only are we making noise, but we're making noise in a way that's that's coordinated such that you can understand it, and in a, in a way that you can hear it. All right. But right now, you all are sitting here and you're listening to me. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you hear me say these words, you understand me, right? Okay. Sometimes, due to maybe a problem of the central nervous system, there may be an injury where somebody hears, they can hear, their ears work fine, but their brain doesn't understand what's being asked of them or what's being said. Or it may be the other way around. Maybe they hear and understand, but they can't respond because they can't form the right words or think of the right words. They may want to say, um, water, but instead they say book. Okay, it, it's just it, it's a form of of uh, you know there's different forms of, of speech impairments. Apraxia may be something where somebody can't coordinate the, the words properly and they say them um, incorrectly. Um, aphasia is where they might not be able to find the words um, to say or when they hear the words, they don't understand them. So it's either receptive, so they're either re receiving and not understanding, or expressive, where they're trying to say a word and they can't say it properly. Speech therapists also work <coughs> with swallowing. Okay, That's an important function that you do each day, which so is you're taking in food and water. Um, and, and because of their knowledge of, of what's going on in the mouth and throat for speech, they also um, are trained to assess and treat people who have problems with swallowing. Dysphagia is what that's called. So some of the tests they do, they may present a patient with a couple of different textures of food or liquid and observe them, watch them eat or drink and see do they, are they able to take that down and swallow it safely or do they take something down and then cough because the food or the drink went into the airway instead of through the esophagus. Okay, maybe there was leakage of that food or drink into the airway. Okay, that's a big deal, right? What happens if you get food or drink in your airway and you're not able to get it out? Choke. You can choke. So worst case scenario, yeah, you get something in there and it's stuck and you lose your ability to breathe. Let's just say it's just some liquid. It doesn't block your airway. Let's say it's liquid and it goes down in there. You guys have done this. Yeah, you guys have done this before. You've all taken in a drink. You've sucked it in your, uh, into your airway. What do you do? You cough, if it feels bad, you cough, and you clear it out. Some people don't have that ability. They don't have that recognition that that's going in there. When that fluid goes in there, it's got germs in it, probably from your mouth. They settle in your lungs, and it turns into pneumonia. You got it. And for somebody who's not in good health, um, who might be elderly and have uh, multiple um, 
uh, health conditions, pneumonia can be deadly. For you and I, no big deal probably. We take some medicine, we get better, okay? But for some it might be, that might be too much. So speech therapists, again, they're taking care of kids early on in life, zero, you know, in, the, in their first few months, to people at the end of their life who might be having problems with perhaps swallowing, okay? Um, <clears throat> Settings where we where we take care of people. I told you we're in and out. We we've got just here in Monette. We've got our hospital where we take care of patients who are in the hospital. We take care of patients in our outpatient clinic. So these are people that can get up, walk, and come to us for their therapy. We take care of people in their homes, uh, whether it be home health care. Uh, we do uh, pediatric therapy for 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 kids that are zero to age three through a program in the state of Missouri called First Steps. Um, we may be in nursing homes, long-term care facilities. There may be special hospitals. So in Springfield, we have uh, in, in a special hospital where we do uh, mainly rehab. So people who might need long-term rehab, inpatient rehab facilities. Okay, uh, we'll, we may we'll have therapists there as well. We're in schools, right? You've probably grown up through school and known some of your friends or some of your classmates that may have to go to occupational therapy or speech therapy or physical therapy during their school day. We take care of kids in those settings. We may have therapists in, in the workforce. So we may be have, have therapists at, say, a, um, a manufacturing facility where they have workers who are doing um, manual labor and may be at high risk of injuring themselves. A therapist may be responsible for finding ways to keep those, ther those workers safe or to address any potential problems that might come up because of repetitive injuries. So somebody's putting, putting something together in this manufacturing facility and they're doing this repeatedly over and over again or they're lifting overhead over and over again. How do we keep them from having arm or shoulder problems? Or maybe they're lifting. How do we keep, teach them to lift properly so that they don't injure themselves, okay? So hopefully, maybe by having this discussion so far, you can see that therapy, at least physical therapy, is not just exercise. It's not just treating the broken leg or the sprained ankle. It's it really is much much more than that. And and um, you know when you get into a profession like physical therapy, what's cool is that you can be the the person that kind of does it all or sees all these different things. There's a lot of variety, but you may have this really strong interest in something special. Okay, a specialized type of therapy. So some of you may really want to just take care of kids. Right, you want to do pediatrics. Some of you in, may, may be thinking about nursing, and you may be thinking about kind of doing a, a, you know, pediatric nursing. All right? We can do that in therapy, too. You may just want to work with, with orthopedic injuries, bone and muscle injuries as a therapist. You may just want to work with neurological injuries, brain and spinal cord type of injuries. Or you, or you may just want to work in the hospital setting or in the outpatient setting. So uh, again, the point is, uh, there's not there's not one path as a therapist. You have a lot of different options, a lot of different variety of, of things to do, and it keeps it interesting. But all in all, you have the opportunity to really affect somebody's quality of life, and that's that's what's cool about it. I'll stop there for a second and and, and ask for some questions. So you guys got some things that I didn't answer for you. Yeah. What skills are needed, like to be in those occupations? Well. Some of the skills that you're learning right now are no different than, uh, you know, as a, a for nursing are, are similar to, to, to therapies. And we'll talk, I'll, you know, we'll talk to you about some of them here in just a minute. Patient care skills, right? You got to know how to take care of people. You got to know how to take care of people safely. You need to know how to communicate, all right? Because as therapists, just like in a lot of other health health professions, we're educators. You are teachers, right? If you come to me and you need to learn how to walk again, or I need to help you try to figure out, problem solve, how to be mobile again now that you have this injury, I need to teach. I need to tell you how to do that. I need to show you. If you aren't a good communicator, your effectiveness in teaching that patient what they need to do is not, is not going to be as good. Okay? So you've got to be a good communicator. You've got to be able to write. All right? You all know that we don't take care of patients and just do it and then go on to the next thing, right? We got we to gotta document. We have to write a lot of things down. Okay? We have to document. Yes? 
Day-to-day -day duties. Um, it varies greatly, okay? It varies greatly depending upon where you're at. Okay, so it might be um, uh, you're evaluating a patient. patient comes to you in your clinic and you evaluate them and, and, and write that up or you're taking care of your treating them. But just generally, all therapists, they're, they're, they're evaluating, assessing patients and treating them throughout their day. Okay? Like I said, documentation is really important. So we're, we're recording what's going on with the patient, what the patient is telling us. We're measuring. We may be measuring range of motion. We may be measuring muscle strength. We be, may be measuring balance, okay? Coordination, how well does somebody, how, how coordinated are they with their hands or their legs or their feet, all right? So we're assessing all those things and we're documenting them in the patient's medical record, all right? Other skills that, that you need, it's a, they're physical jobs, just like nursing and other healthcare fields, they're, they're physical. We don't go in and sit at our desk and work behind a computer all day, all right? So as far as skill set, you need to be, you need to take care of yourself as much as you're able to take care of your patient, because if you can't physically do the job, then you're doing your patients a, dis a disservice, all right? So you gotta be able to squat down at the bedside, um, you gotta be able to push and pull on people, um, so physically, as a physical therapist especially, and to some extent an occupational therapist, you do have to be, um, uh, you know, in good shape to do the work. Yes? I, I, was, I went to Drury University as, uh, um, for my first four years, and there I studied exercise and sports science. Uh, they don't have a physical therapy program, okay? So that's, here's a good, good point that, to make is that, um, you know, you have about six colleges, six universities in the state of Missouri right now who have physical therapy programs, degree programs. Quite a few, right? Uh, but you don't just, you know, you can go to one of those schools. You can go to Missouri State right now as a freshman, start there, get your undergraduate education in, um, but you don't just automatically get into physical therapy school. It's really competitive, all right? It's a competitive uh, admissions process. So I tell students at this point in your career, if you want to be a, P a PT, an OT, or a speech therapist, make that decision fairly soon and set your mind to being an outstanding student, not just now, but your first semester in college, right? Your second semester, your sophomore year, your junior year, because if you don't start off on the right foot, you may not be able to recover. All right, so after your four years of under, or your third year and in your fourth year, you're deciding, hey, I want to apply to physical therapy school. You can apply to all these schools as long as you have all the coursework done and, and the prerequisites taken that they, they require. They're going to look at you. They're going to look at your GPA and see how it is. If you slacked off the first year or two in college, you're like, ah, oh, I can do this. This is no big deal. This is easy. And you get out of those first two years with a 3.0 GPA, which is pretty darn good. You know, that's fine. It's probably not going to be enough. Not probably. It won't be enough. Okay? You may be competing with 500 other students for 50 spots in the PT program for that year. Okay? You may have a 1 in 10 chance of getting in. You better, you better stand out, right? Academically, you need to stand out. Civically, so you need to do some things to show that, hey, you're a good citizen, right? Maybe you're in some clubs, you're in organizations, you're doing some community service, that you have some work experience that you can draw on, okay, that maybe relates to this. So maybe look for jobs in a hospital setting. Be a CNA. If you, want to be, if you, if you do CNA work and you want to be a physical therapist, hey, you're taking care of patients every day. That's going to look really good, okay? So can you do that? And do some and, and be a good student at the same time. Make yourself look good. Told you you got to be able to write because you got to be able to document. You got to also have to be able to write really well because most of these applications that you're going to be writing are going to ask you to write an essay. You're going to address some question or problem that they have. And if you can't write really well and communicate through your writing very well, and they're reviewing your application for physical therapy school, mm, this doesn't look too good. They're going to put you aside. They're not going to pick you for an interview. Okay, so you got to be able to write. I told you you got to be able to communicate really well, didn't I? All right, if you want to get into PT school, guess what? Guess what else you have to do? You have to sit in this room with a bunch of professors, really intimidating, and they interview you. Okay, 
So you have to be able to communicate and answer questions that they give you and express yourself in a way that, that impresses them. Okay, so when you don't want to go to classes that have reading and writing as part of their their coursework, um, you know you probably don't want to do, be a physical therapist. It's just it's basic stuff and it's important. And you need to be able to do it well. I went to Drury University for the first four years, graduated from there and applied to PT school. I was accepted at, at uh, University of Missouri and, and Missouri State. I went to University of Missouri. Um, have a, they have a long standing program, uh, um, good history and, and, and a good reputation. And I was very fortunate to be there for three years. Other questions? Yep. Have you ever had just an injury so bad? I mean, like, when someone comes in for physical therapy, have you just, like, said it's a liability? And just not... Oh, no, no, I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't not choose to take care of somebody. Have we had injuries or, or illnesses or, um, you know, uh, conditions that were really, really bad? Yeah. And that's that's the tough part is that sometimes you see people that are they're 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 so impacted by whatever has happened to them, whether it be a central nervous system or a musculoskeletal injury, that they may never recover. And despite all your best efforts as a therapist, you may not make that much progress. Okay. We have a patient that we're seeing who was um, in Mexico and uh, was um, uh, bitten by a mosquito and had West Nile virus. West Nile virus then turned into Guillain-Barre syndrome. Okay. Um, this gentleman, when he returned from Mexico within the first day or two of being back, um, started getting weak. Within uh, just a couple of hours, went from feeling for pretty normal to couldn't get out of bed, couldn't walk to the bathroom, rushed to the hospital, and he's pretty much paralyzed within a really short period of time, and that's Guillain-Barre. That's what you'll see. Sometimes people don't survive. Sometimes people have to be on ventilators to, to breathe. Um, and so we continue to take care of this patient um, uh, because we don't know. We're, gonna, we're holding on to hope that his muscles and his nervous, his nervous system will wake back up, and he will start moving again. Okay, He can move some of his hands and arms. Um, a little bit in his trunk, and hardly any in his legs. So he's in a wheelchair. So there's a good example of somewhere where, you know, we, you know, we we haven't been able to work with this person in three months and get them back to normal, um, because of the extent of the injuries. I say injuries; it's really, an, I guess, an illness, but an illness that affects the nervous system. So yeah, there are those times. It's tough. I hate, I hate it because well, ideally we want to make everybody better, but the reality is we, we don't always. Other questions? Anything else? I've answered all of them. Like, you guys know everything now, how right? How do you properly use your hands? Because, like, as a kid, you learn how to use, like, our lower body, but, like, is there a certain way to so you're talking about like how an occupational therapist might yeah. work with the job. Yeah, there are. I mean, um, we'll think about writing skills, right? Okay, you don't hold your pencil like this and write, do you? <laughs> some of you do. Okay, so you needed some occupational therapist when you started to learn to write. But you, you, you. There's a way that you hold it that allows you to to, to write most effectively, right? To write well. We don't we don't hold it like we don't grasp it like this. Okay, there's some some fine fine motor task we need to learn. Okay, so is there a, a right way? Yeah, in some cases there is. It's depending on what you're doing. Okay, um, you know how do you hold how do you hold your fork when you're when you're eating or cutting food or how do you hold a knife? Right, there are ways that you do that that are that are best uh, for how we're designed. Okay, yeah, you don't stab your food and try to put it in your mouth. You know, there's a way you hold your fork, and, and so to answer that question, yeah. And that's what occupational therapists do, right? They, they really work with, with, with anybody, kids and, and adults, and, and how, to, how to use utensils or how to use their hands to, to do those daily activities. The reason that we, I think we, 
have this conversation, uh, one of the most important reasons, in my opinion. As a, as a healthcare worker, whenever you're caring for a patient, um, your goal is to care for them safely, because um, you, you never want to do harm, right? Um, but you also have to take care of yourself, right? Because what I said in there, therapists, we have, we have, you know, these are physical jobs. You have to take care of yourself physically. If you're injured, you can't do your work, okay? Same thing in nursing, anybody who's handling a patient. You gotta be sure that you're taking care of yourself and doing it in the right way. Body mechanics, ergonomics, these are terms that, that describe how we move and how we hold ourselves so that we keep ourselves as safe as possible when we're handling our patients. So this is the discussion we're having today, okay? I wanna hopefully give you a few tips that you can take with you when you're at the bedside and you're caring for somebody, all right? Um, let's just generally talk about information when you're caring for somebody. If you're going in to see somebody in a room, you're going to take care of a patient and you've never seen them before, what do you want to know about them before you go in there? Yes? What's wrong with them? Sure. Why are they here? What's, what's their illness? What's their, what's their problem? What else? Who, yeah, what's their, their name, what they prefer to be called? That's good. You're right. You got to know that. Don't go into Mr. Jones' room and call him Mr. Smith, right? Don't do that. What else? What did you say? Have any recent surgeries? So know as much detail as you can about their medical status. Talk with the people who have been caring for them. Nurses will, will do this communication at shift change, right? So they'll get together. So one nurse is done with their shift, another one's coming on, and they get together and they huddle together and they say, all right, Mr. Smith in room two, here's what's going on with Mr. Smith. Here's what he's done today. Here are the medicines we're giving. Here's been his activity. He's getting up and sitting at the edge of the bed, but he needs one person to help him from get from the bed to the chair. He's a high fall risk. His balance is not good. Okay? And then you'll go on to, to Mr. Jones and you'll say, this is Mr. Jones. He's doing really well. He's not having any pain. He gets up the edge bed by himself. He can get over to the chair. He can walk to the bathroom with your, with your, observ with your, with your assistants just watching him. He's doing well. He's going home tomorrow. You know, these are two different, two different scenarios, right? Where, where somebody's moving pretty well. The other person's maybe not. The other person's not moving as well, is weaker, is sicker, maybe having pain. And they need more assistance. My point in telling you this, when you go to take care of somebody, knowledge is so important. Your, your understanding of the situation is really important so that you're prepared, okay? You've got the, the tools and the understanding that you need to take care of this patient safely. What if that patient needed two people to get them up to the edge of the bed because they were larger, all right? You've got to know that. So you got to know if you're going to go in and you're going to start getting that person up at the edge of the bed and you're by yourself and you're like, I can't do this. i got to have help. Go in, go in knowing that so that you take that person with you. If they need a walker and they don't have one, make sure you take one with you. All right? Make sure you got your gate belt. All these things that are going to make your job easier. Okay? So communicate. Communicate with the nurse, the other staff, so that you know what you're getting into. Let's talk about body mechanics. You guys probably know this. Um, you know, our, our body's meant to be sort of in these, these positions that, re, that reduce stress on them. So when, I'm, when I stand like this, my body likes this because my joints are sort of in these neutral positions. They're not bent or straightened too far. They're not bent over. So my body likes this. My body doesn't like this, right? This is bad posture. This is bad positioning. My spine is curved. My head is forward. You know, this is a place where... If I'm doing something strenuous in this position, I may have too much stress on my back and I might injure my back, a muscle, I may injure a disc in my back, okay? So it's important when we're thinking about moving that we try to, especially with our spine, all right? The spine is the place, you know, neck, mid-back, and low-back is where people get injured when they're handling patients. So you want to think about the spine kind of having those, you've, you've done some anatomy, right? You know, we've got spine curves, your spine's not a straight you know, a straight line. It's got curves. It's got natural curves. You want to you wanna maintain those, those normal curves of your spine when you're working. 
So if you're working with somebody at the bedside, you don't want to make your back curve like this because this is not a normal curve, right? This is a position of injury. You want to find a way to maintain those by either bending at your hip, keeping your back, you know, my, my back doesn't really move. I lean forward, but my spine, my spine doesn't change, okay? Maybe I need to do something here. If I'm going to bend down at the edge of the bed, got a catheter, we need to empty a catheter back. So we're going to, we're going to do this, all right? You're going to squat. My posture pretty much stays the same from my spine. I just bend at my knees and my hips, and I take care of it, okay? Don't forget you've got tools at your disposal to make it easier. Maybe. Where is it? No. So there's no reason why if you're taller and you're going to be spending some time at the edge of the bed, let's say you're dressing a wound, you're giving a bath, bed bath, you're whatever you, are, you might be doing with this patient, bring that patient up to you so that you can stand here and do your work without being bent over, okay? When you're done, what's important? Got to go back down, right? We don't want our patients hanging out and up in the air, okay? So use, use the bed to help. That's why they're there, okay? <clears throat> Can I have a patient volunteer? I don't care who. Somebody come up. But okay, on your back. On your back. Okay. So, all right. Go ahead and lay down. Go ahead and lay down. All right. So, um, if if you know, one of the common things we might do is help a patient from laying down in bed to sitting up, all right? Step by step, all right? So let's say, um, what's your name? Caitlin. Caitlin. Let's say Caitlin. Say Caitlin, we know, we've talked to the nurse before we've gone in, we know that Caitlin can pretty much get herself up the edge of bed. So what's my role then if I'm coming in to, to, to see Caitlin to give her medicines or to set her up for a meal? What's my role then? If she can get herself up the edge of bed, what do I do? Watch. Stand by, right? Stand by. So I say, all right, Caitlin, let's get up. We're going we're gonna to sit up, and we're going to get in the chair for lunch. All right? Do I need to pull on her when she can do this? No. But how would you look if you came in and you started pulling on somebody who can get up to the edge of bed by themselves? That patient immediately is going to be like, you don't, do you even know me? <laughs> you know, I don't, need, I don't need this, right? So, again, you've you got to know. So I come in and say, hey, Caitlin, why don't you sit up and don't, you know, always, always be careful. You never know. Caitlin has gotten up at the edge of the bed every time we've asked her to to this point. But maybe something happened. Maybe she's a little dehydrated. And so we say, Caitlin, sit up. So sit up at the edge of the bed. And let's say I walk away because I'm going to go do something. My back's turned to Caitlin. She sits up and she's dehydrated because maybe she's, you know, maybe her medicines are off or she's not been drinking enough or she's vomited overnight. And then she gets lightheaded, and the next thing I know, she's passed out, and she's ended up on the floor, okay? Because I wasn't paying attention, all right? So, yeah, she can do it, and she was able to do it yesterday, but now today it might be different. So, Caitlin sits up. I'm like, how are you doing, Caitlin? I'm doing good. Good. Are you lightheaded? Are you dizzy? Are you feeling real? We're good. You're standing by, right? You're not ignoring them. You're not walking away. You're standing by. Are, you, are they safe? Yeah, they're safe. They're good. Need to go get something right over here, get it, and you can come back to them. Just always be ready for worst case scenario, all right? If you do that, you're going to reduce the risk that something bad's going to happen, okay? Lay back down. Let's say that Caitlin um, is on the other side of this, and she needs help. She needs my help to sit up. She can't do it on her own, okay? Let's say she can do most of it. Let's say she can do 50% of it, but... Maybe not all of it. Best way for our patients, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on this side. The best way for our patients to um, get to the edge of the bed is not to just sit straight up, all right? Maybe like she would normally as a, as a kid, but it's to roll to the side first, okay? 
So let's talk about how we roll, how somebody log rolls. We want them to bend their knees up because it's much easier. They get some leverage from their knees when their knees are bent up, okay? So Caitlin, bend your knees up for me. What's, what's going on with your right leg, Caitlin? I had surgery. How long ago? Two months, three months. For what? Can you tell, do you mind telling us? My hip. Do you have any limitations? No. Do you, have any, no. do you have any pain? Yes. Okay. Right? I, this is important for me to know if I'm going to move Caitlin. All right? Thanks for sharing. <laughs> <clears throat> kind of pick up on these things when you're moving your leg that way. All right? Um, so, yeah. So, if, what, if she, what if she was a hip replacement patient? Are you? You're not, right? You're not. A, okay. Just making sure you'd be a, you're a little young for that. All right. If she's a hip replacement patient, I'm not going to go through this, but hip replacement patients have very specific rules about how they get in and out of bed. All right. Because we don't want to ruin what the surgeon just did. And there's a potential we could if we do something wrong. So you need to know that as a good example. Caitlin tells me she's fine, no limitations. So we're going to go through with this. But you bend your knees up first. You want them to roll. So Caitlin's going to roll towards me. I want her knees up. If you've got bed rails and they need the bed rails, you can put them up so they can grab on and pull themselves over. If they don't, sometimes they just get in your way if you don't need them, okay, as a caregiver. But let's say, all right, Caitlin, I want you to roll over to your left side, all right? And so she can do that on her own. Okay, go back. But let's say she needs maybe 50% help from me. She needs a little help to get all the way over. Still want the knees up. Maybe I've had to help her get those knees to that position. And then I'm going to help roller body mechanics right so I'm going to bend at my hips and my knees all right I'm going to reach behind her hip behind her shoulder you can count down so that they know on the count of three let's roll all right we have one two three and we roll okay notice my position okay I stay down all right stay down I actually go back <clears throat> Caitlin's helping me she's she's and she's not very big so this is easy not every one of your patients is going to be a little bitty like Caitlin, right? You're going to have patients that are, that are bigger than you. You're going to have patients that are overweight. So you've got to use your body really well to do this. So let's imagine, no, don't do that. But let's say, <laughs> let's say your patient is 300 pounds, okay? What, was it going to be that easy? No, I'm going to have to help a lot more. And so use your legs and use your body. So if I'm here, okay, and I'm down, what I'll do is I'll step back. So I, I'll pull and I just shift my weight from the front to the back as I pull, so I'm using my body to get this, to, to help her move, all right? Do I walk away? No, she's close to the edge of the bed. Don't walk away, stay there. You need to take a break, take a break. How you doing? Doing okay? Talk to them, let them know what next steps are, right? Here's what we're gonna do next, so that they know and they can prepare in their head. Maybe they've not done it this way before. <clears throat> I want you to think about leverage, right? How do we get leverage to get Caitlin from her side to sitting at the edge of the bed? What can we use? You could, that's a good point. We could raise the head of the bed. Lift it up, so instead of laying flat, say she's halfway there. That helps, right? It helps big time. So don't be afraid to use it, all right? What about her, her body? What can we do with her body to help her sit up? Okay. Lift the bed might help me, but it's not going to help her. Okay. What if I do this? What if I take her, her legs and I put them here? Okay. And we drop them. Her legs come down and it, it's almost lifting her shoulders up, right? Stay, stay down for me. Okay. <laughs> See that? So it's kind of like a, it's, it's like a lever. Okay. So Here's her fulcrum, and it's taking some of the pressure off of her shoulders, all right? So, again, let's say she can do some of this, but I just need to help a little bit. So I tell her, we're going to let's slide your legs off the edge of the bed, and then I want you to push up from the side with your arms so she can push with her right arm, okay, and her left elbow. So she's got her left elbow in the bed, so go ahead and push up, okay, and you just kind of guide and assist. I don't have to help much, right, but I'm right there. She just set up, what am I gonna do? Stay there, you okay? If I had a dizzy, everything okay, okay? Go back down to your side. This time, I gotta do the lifting, all right? 
This is where it really comes in, comes, it comes um, important for you to use those legs. So, <clears throat> good body mechanics. I like to put my arm under their shoulder, not under their head or neck. You're not gonna pull there. You gotta pull under something that's got some structure to it, okay? So I'll tell the patient, I'm gonna put my arm under your shoulder, Caitlin, okay? And sometimes their head, sorry, your glasses are in the way, aren't they? And take those off for a second so I don't push them around. Okay, if I can get my hand under their shoulder, rest your head right there. I'm kind of supporting her head too with my arm, all right? So when they come up, they've got a little bit of support there, okay? What I'll do with my, with my top hand or my bottom hand, whatever's closest to the foot, bring the, arm, bring the legs off, and at the same time, I, I, I come up, I lift, okay? So I've got the leverage of her legs, my lift from the right hand, and I come up and go back down. Don't pull so much with your arm. Shift your body, okay? I'm go back under your shoulder, okay? All right, so I pull off, and watch my body. All I do is shift over, I shift my weight. So I'm not, you know, trying to manhandle somebody with one arm. I'm using, I'm using physics to help me get her up, okay? You stay close by, <clears throat> make sure they're okay. Next thing we're gonna do is stand up, all right? Maybe we're gonna go walk, maybe we're just gonna transfer from here to the wheelchair or to the bedside commode, all right? Give some time, don't get in a hurry. All right, a good point here, people will be, will be in a hurry to go to the bathroom. And guess what? You're gonna have accidents and it's gonna happen. But plan ahead, okay? Get to somebody and take them to the bathroom before it's urgent if you can, all right? It's a lot safer, okay? But now that we're here, we gotta make sure what's our next move and how do I keep them safe? Yeah. You guys have two examples here of common Common gate belts, although you will not see these anymore, okay? Um, these can't be cleaned um, well enough, so you won't see cloth gate belts, um, at least in our hospital. You might somewhere else, but not, in, not at Cox. You'll see something that is um, wipeable and cleanable, okay? <clears throat> I, I like these examples, though, because it shows me the two types of buckles. Okay, and you... You don't have shoes on, be careful. Don't sli what? slip out here, but come up, stand up for me. All right, and, and just come out the front a little bit. <clears throat> so, um, a little bit farther, there you go. Okay, so when I put these on, <clears throat> I, I'll just be honest, I, I hate these buckles. You're gonna use them, though you need to know how to use them, right, you're gonna see them. So I want you to know what the limitations of them are. See, this is why I hate them. I have to pull up this lever, and I have to feed the belt through. There's a lot of resistance to that sliding, right? It, it doesn't slide through there very smoothly, okay? I think it's hard, all right? And when you put it on somebody, turn around. Why don't you turn your back to me? Turn your back to me. Uh, yeah. Yes, they'll be hanging on the walls. Okay? So I've, I usually put this on when somebody's sitting. Right? You put it on before you stand up. Don't put them on when they're standing. But here's what usually happens. Is that tight enough? No. Really not. No, I mean, it's moving around quite a bit. I will tell you, this happens every time. I don't care how good you are or how long you've done it. You put this on somebody when they're sitting down in the bed. We are different shape when we sit. All right? I don't care your body type. You're a different shape. Your, your, your abdomen changes. So you put this on in here when they're, when they're sitting and you think, I got it tight, it's good. And then they stand up and they change shape. And now all of a sudden it's loose. And it's not really what you want. Okay, so I have to tighten this. Okay, again, you're gonna, you're gonna see these. What do you have to do to tighten this? Turn this way just a little bit. You've gotta pull that and pull that. You gotta use both hands. She's standing up, I've got both hands on the belt, and I don't have any control over her. That's a problem. That's why I don't like these belts, okay? It's too loose, I've gotta tighten it. I can't tighten this, I can't maybe doing that right there, then I gotta, it's hard, all right? And at the same time, you're like, 
pulling around on this and, and you're displacing her, you're moving her around, right? All right, so that's what I warn you about with these gate belts. Be careful, they're just a little harder to use. <clears throat> we do have some that have the slick, slick wipeable finish, the vinyl finish with this buckle. These metal buckles are my absolute favorite because here's what you can do. You know they go under the teeth first, right? Under the teeth. Okay, and I'm going to make it loose like I would have done if she put it on sitting. Now she stood up. Okay. And it's loose, and i got to do something about it. Come back just a little bit towards me. Okay. I don't have good control, but I'm going to be real close to her. Watch what I can do. Okay. One hand. I've got one hand on her. I can even hold on to the belt. All I do right there is I take the, take the loop in the middle of the buckle and I tighten it and I'm in there, okay? So that's why I love these. And if you're loose, you don't have to use two hands. I can put my hand on her shoulder. She's really unsteady. I could do this and all I've got to do is that, that right there and it's tight, so like I want it, okay? And even with the vinyl, these really are great. I mean, we, I love cloth gate belts. They're they're the best. As you can imagine, infection prevention is kind of a big deal now, right? And you can't take a sanitary wipe and clean that and get it clean. They just stopped that several years ago. So we have to have a, a smooth surface, not a fabric surface. So that's why even the ones with the vinyl coating on them, though, they're pretty flexible. And because of that metal buckle, the belt slides really well in that metal buckle, OK? All right, go back to the edge of the bed. <coughs> Okay, so got the patient at the edge of the bed. We're set up. She's feeling good. We got the gate belt on, and we're gonna we're gonna transfer. Okay, let's. Uh, I'm gonna grab a chair. All right, we'll pretend this is a wheelchair or a commode. Okay, so we're gonna stand up and and, and move over into that. Well, if it's a wheelchair, what are you doing with that wheelchair before you ever start? Locking the brakes, okay? Locking the brakes. If it's a commode, doesn't have brakes on it, just, you know, four legs, just be smart. Put it close. If you've got somebody that you know is not going to move very well, get it right there next to them. Don't put the commode over there and say, all right, Caitlin, we're going to go over there, and she can barely take any steps, right? So this is opportunity for something to go wrong. Redu reduce that opportunity by making it easy on you and the patient, <clears throat> okay? All right. Again, it's body mechanics. If Caitlin can get up by herself, what am I gonna do? Stand by. Hand on a gate belt, stand up, Caitlin. All right, turn around and have a seat. I'm just guarding her, going with her, right? It's easy. Okay, come back. If Caitlin needs half of my assistance to stand up and to hold her when she's up, right? Okay? I'm going to do a little bit more, all right? I might be both hands on the gate belt, one on either side, okay? Because she might need me to help come up, all right? Go back down. Well, notice my body mechanics. I didn't stand up here, bend over, have my back round out, and pull, okay? That's injury waiting to happen. But I got to get low, okay? I got to get low. So I got down here. I even... In some cases, if somebody's knees, they're not very strong, I put my knees right in front of theirs. I block their knees. And I can pull her towards me, okay? Go back down. So I block my knees, and I pull her towards me, and then we go up together. This is a reminder. Go ahead and sit down. Sometimes you gotta get close to your patients, right? Sometimes you gotta be pretty close, all right? There's a reason for that, right? You're standing back here because you don't want to get close to your patient. You don't have much control. You're not as strong when your arm's out here. But when you're right here, I got good control. She starts to lean back. I'm right there. I can pull her into me. Okay. She starts to go to the left. I just I, I correct her and I'm right there because I've got good control over. Her, all right. If she's going to transfer to the bedside commode or to the wheelchair, she may take some small steps. Get your feet out of the way, 
okay? Take little short steps as you pivot and turn. Good. And then <clears throat> sometimes people don't know how to sit very well or they're weak, right? And so they like to flop, all right? Don't let them flop, all right? If you're having to help them, they probably need your help sitting down just as much as they do standing up. So when you go to sit down, what are, they, what are you going to do? You're going to sit with them, all right? So, Caitlin, as you start to sit down, I'm going to go down too, okay? I'm going to squat with them so I can help control. Don't just let them go, all right? Especially if they've got something that hurts, all right? Come back over. <clears throat> now, there may be times where somebody has to pretty much totally be assisted. You really got to help them a lot. I would advise you that in most cases, unless you've got a little Caitlin, in most cases, you probably need to have two people. If somebody can't hold themselves up and they require maximum assist, if you're not bigger and more powerful than that person, you, you just get two. And in that case, there's somebody on one side and somebody on the other, and you both have good control. Each have a hand. You've got, you got, you got an extra set of hands on this patient, so if something goes wrong, you're there. Maybe, maybe you both have to stand up. Maybe you both have to kind of keep your feet there and block her knees. So if, she tries, if that left leg tries to give out, make your leg try to give out. Okay, I'm not going to let it give out because my leg or my knee is right in front of hers. Okay, so never, don't be afraid to ask for help. It's important. In the case that you can transfer this patient, maybe they can't stand up all the way, but maybe they can partial stand and you can turn and pivot them to the chair. Okay. You really, again, you gotta, you gotta get comfortable, right? You gotta, be, you gotta be close with the patient. In this case, I like to put my hands behind the patient, between their arms, and I will go, I don't know if you guys can see this, but I'm, I actually put my hands through the belt, okay? Like this, and I'll put my hands on the back of their hip, their pelvic bone, okay? Because what I want, don't help me so much, okay? <laughs> what I want is I wanna pull her forward and lift her up. I'm pulling her into me, okay? Go back down, all right? So I'm gonna pull her into me when she stands. Here's another thing too, I forgot to talk about this. Kayla, stand up, but don't put your head forward. What? Stand up. <laughs> <laughs> you use the bed, cheater, scoot out. <laughs> all right, now sit down. Now you can't push your legs against the bed. Try to stand up. <laughs> what do you do? You fall right back in the bed, right? Yeah. My point is, you got to be able to lean forward when you stand up, right? So stand up normally. You see how her, how her head comes forward? We say nose over toes. Move your nose forward, get it over your toes. Because when you do that, when you do that, your butt almost automatically comes off the bed, right? If you do it well enough, right? Let's have a seat. I will tell you, though, if you take care of an elderly patient who has fallen, they don't want to do that because they just fell. And when they do this, they think, oh, I'm going to fall again. And so they will just be sitting at the edge of the bed and they're, they're trying to get up and you're trying to help them get up and they're leaning back and they can't do it. So talk them through that. It's so important that your patient knows, give them the tools they need to help you, right? Because if you're trying to help somebody stand up and they won't lean forward, they're dead weight. You're lifting. You're lifting them completely. But if you can get them to lean forward, I mean, I go from bearing maybe, you know, most of my weight in my butt right now to like hardly any. I'm like, I'm right there, just barely there. So get them to bring that head and, and chest forward. And when you have to help them do that because they can't initiate that, this is where it helps. Be close. I like to go hands around. You can hook your thumbs in the belt, but I want hands kind of on their hips, lean forward. Notice how, look how low I get, all right? I'm like same height, head height as her, and I pull her up towards me, we pivot, and we sit. Go ahead, go ahead and start to sit, there you go. And I control on the way down, all right? <clears throat> if I'm gonna pivot somebody from the bed to the left, don't put your feet like this, because you stand up, and now you get off balance and you fall back, right? Your foot position's really important. So if we're gonna go from here to there, get in this position, open yourself up so that you can, you can stand them, pivot, and go down, all right? So pay attention to your foot, your, your feet position. Don't be close together. 
you'll tip over. Okay. Um, let's go back to the front of the bed. To the bed. Oh, any questions about any of that? All right. <laughs> Caitlin's gonna walk in the walker, Caitlin. Okay. High. So we're it's a little high, right? How do you know? You guys have you fitted? Yes. Awesome. What's another thing you could look for? The, this lining with the. Okay. What about the elbows? Okay. All right. Way to go, everybody. All right, so way too high. I'm not going to change it, but it's way too high. Come to the middle, because I want to, I want, yeah, come in the middle of the room a little bit. All right, right there. All right, so if I'm going to guard Caitlin when she's walking, we're going to use your case, right? It's your right hip, okay? Your right hip has a problem. It had surgery. It's, maybe it's weaker or it hurts, right? Where do I want to be standing when I guard her? On her right side. Right side, okay? Do you want to be up here on her right side? Here on the right side or here? Yes. Okay, good. You guys know this, all right? I, I, I just want to prove my case here as to why you guard somebody from this position, all right? If I'm, if I'm right here and I have my hand on her and Caitlin starts to fall forward, okay, what do I have to do? I'm already in a good position to pull her back. What if she starts to fall backwards? Start to fall backwards. Go ahead. I'm right there, right? Right? If she starts, right? If she goes, if she goes straight down, you guys have seen this, you know. I might have to put. I might kind of have to lean her against my knee. To, and and you're probably calling for help then. All right, don't be afraid. But if you're holding somebody up uh, up in the middle of the hall or in the in their room, hey, you know, help in here. Whatever. What do you got to say? Get them in there. Because you're not going to be able to last very long, especially if it's somebody that's big. If it is somebody that's big, don't don't hurt yourself, but do everything you can to protect the patient. But if she is going to fall, at least she's going to fall from here to here. And that's right. You're going to find a way to slide her down your leg, reduce the impact of her falling, and more than anything, protect her head. Okay? Protect her head. All right? So if she starts to go to the left, where am I? Okay, I'm right here. I pull her back. She starts to go to the right. She falls right into me, okay? The point is, I don't like being directly at the side because I don't have good control of here and here. I've got control of this. If she goes that way, I can pull her back. If she comes this way, she's into me. But I don't have good control of forward and back. But if I go at just off the back shoulder at an angle, this is good. If you've got somebody that's walking slowly, taking their time, look at my feet, okay? I'm ready. If something goes wrong, I'm ready. Am I ready? No. no. Any of you guys are athletes, right? You don't play a sport with your feet together, right? Because you're not as strong. You're not as fast. You're not as agile. You, you, you play your sport like this, a little bit bent in your knees. You're ready to go, okay? So just keep these things in mind when you're guarding a patient, all right? You'll keep them safe. Worst case scenario, if they go to the ground, You've done everything you can because you've got the gate belt on, you're in the right position. You couldn't stop them from falling, but you stopped them from hurting themselves on the way to the floor, and that's what's most important, okay? Questions? Did I miss anything, Mrs. Schmidley? Sketches, anything? Here, grab your shoes here. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, anything else? You guys feel good about it? I love that you already know some of these things. I know. I mean, I do the same thing every year, and you guys are getting it. So good job. Thank you so much. You're welcome.